Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Jonathan Stockstill, and welcome back to the podcast. If you have not yet, please subscribe. It would mean so much to me. Share it with a friend. We are talking all things family, leadership, church, ministry, missions, music, you name it. We're going to get into it. Today, I'm joined by a dear friend of mine, Joel DeSherry, who started a ministry called Commission Mankind. They dig wells in East Africa, but that's not where it stops. They're doing things all over the world. You're going to get to hear all about this man who's filled with passion filled with fire but he's also a music guy he's a bass player and I just have a really kindred heart with him and so I wanted to bring him on just to kind of highlight the great things that they're doing in East Africa so you're gonna love this episode check it out what's up everybody I'm sitting here with my friend Joel DeSherry what's up Joel what's happening man it's so good to have you I've recently come to really love this ministry Commission Mankind and I'm just so pumped about it. And so Joel was in the area, and I just said, let's let's have a conversation. So uh, Joel, as we just kind of break the ice, you're a musician, and you play. And I really haven't had much of a conversation with you about music before. That's right. But uh, <laughs> but we got to go there. Let's talk about it. All so right. you play bass guitar, right? Correct. All right. What's your favorite bass? Uh, I like the Warwick. The Warwick? Yeah, I have a Warwick uh, neck through uh, five string. All right. Really like, but, um, okay, if you had a, if you chose a second bass, I have a Fender Mustang, like an early '70s model. That's a uh, four string. Yeah, it's a short scale. It's great. Come on, it's a really good tone. Yeah. All right. So amps. Uh, I don't have a fancy amp. I have an Ampeg, and uh, it gets the job done. Got a Limbic preamp and a power amp with it. But um, what about DIs? Just, Do you big on the DI? Uh. Yeah, I have a big pedal board with about 20 different pedals, but <laughs> I've been sitting in my attic for a little while since I've uh, kind of started taking care of kids. Okay, so like if you looked up to one bass player and were like, man, if I just could play like that, then I'd be set. Uh, I really like Joe Dart. He's kind of a newer guy, um, and I like his stuff a lot. So uh, Tasteful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, my, my theory is this. If you have good tone mm -hmm. and you have good taste, mm -hmm. And you have good timing. Yep. And one more T. You have good technique. No, well, I just well, made that well, Wolfpack, <laughs> I don't know if you ever listened to Wolfpack, but Joe Dart plays for them. And he's he's kind of off on his technique on a lot of things. And some of the bass players uh, on podcasts will critique some of the things he's doing, but he accomplishes what he's doing with it, which is different than a lot of other people that use bad technique. <laughs> yeah. And so he's able to use some of these techniques, but actually use them successfully, which is unique about him. All right, so let me ask you this. Do you ever uh, slap the bass? I do. You do? <laughs> so you have been known to to pop it. Cool. Yeah, but I mean, it's not very pop popular anymore. <laughs> no, <so. laughs> back in the day. So we were just talking about old worship music, and we were talking about Ron Canoli and the song Righteousness, Peace, Joy, and the Holy Ghost. And if you've been saved for 25 years, that then surely that was your jam at some point. Righteousness, peace, Joy in the Holy Ghost, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? So he was just talking about Abraham Laboreal. Is that yeah, the, man? Guy's he name? was just the godfather of really awesome bass stuff. You know, uh, he was he was Ancient of Days and all those songs. He was doing all that dun, fun dun, stuff. Well, he didn't just play it. He would dance around the stage, but made it so much more exciting. You know, he's a big old guy and he's jumping around. And yeah. so I, was, I grew up watching that as a kid and I'm like, oh man, this is exciting stuff. I want to do that. So let's talk about worship for a moment. So obviously you're a, um, you're a musician, but You've used your gifts to to praise the Lord and to worship Him in song. Um, give me give me a thought on worship. Why 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 use your craft to worship the Lord in that way? Do you have a key thought when you're on the stage and you're and you're playing? What is kind of a um, recurring thought that you have, or something that that helps you to focus in the right direction? You know, for me, I think that. For some reason, I feel like I can worship God best with a bass in my hands. It may be the piano for you, but like you just feel you get in that one place and you're like, well, if, if I got my piano, if I got my bass, it's like just worship is natural. Right. And then when I'm not on it, I'm thinking about this thing and all. And so for me, I think God created us as worshipers. And there's certain ways that you come in tune with that when you use your gift for him. And so for me, 
I love worship. My dad was a worship leader. That's right. My whole life. So I grew up around him worshiping and being involved in it and seeing it. And uh, so, yeah, it's a really exciting thing. When I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is worship God. Really? Tell like, me about just, that. Just not, not very loud because I'm not a good singer. <laughs> but I begin to sing praise to God in my mind. Like, this first thing when I get up and I'm getting out of bed, this is what I think about. I have to worship God today have to get this mood set right. And so for me, it's every day when I wake up, the first thing is worship. Then I'm going to pray for my family and get into devotions. But the first thing is worship always for me. Man, that's, that's awesome. And does that, I mean, do you just lift your hands and start giving God thanks and praise? What does that look like for you? I just start uh, telling them, uh, you know, sometimes I start singing these old worship songs. I love you, Lord. I lift your name or, you know, whatever it is. For some reason, like God seems to put a different one in my, my mind every morning, but it's usually yeah. some old worship song and I'll just start singing it just comes to me in the morning and it's just a great time nobody yeah. else is up at the house yet and it's quiet and i believe that god finds worshipers yeah his eyes are looking for worshipers and the bible tells us in john 4 that the father is looking for people who will worship in spirit and in truth and as he scanned the earth he found david and david was by himself out there tending sheep a seemingly a menial task but I think the father saw David worshiping and that's what the father loved. Amen. And he called him. I believe that the Lord called him and chose him in those moments because he saw a man after his own heart. I think God is looking for people for private worshipers, you know, I think so. I think I missed God when I was younger and I, and I don't know if this is true, but it's kind of a funny story, but it was a worship night going on at the church at Rod Aguilar's church and, and the bass player had put the bass down and went just go worship, you know, because the anointing was flowing and things were happening. And I felt like God said, you need to go pick up that bass. And I didn't do it. And it was like, I was just, oh man, I might have been like 10, 11 years old or something, you know. Good thing I didn't. It was left-handed bass. Mm. But uh, anyway, it was kind of funny because I always thought back to that time that I felt God called me mm. to play the bass, wow. you know. But it was like when you just said, you know, God reaches reaches out to you as worshipers and I feel like like there was a time that I felt like God said hey you're supposed to do this yeah well you know as we're talking about worship worship can be used in song but really our whole lives are put on the altar and given to the Lord as a sacrifice and um, I feel like songs are kind of cheap you know it cost me nothing to sing a song to the Lord it cost right. me nothing I mean maybe I a hair of pride if I don't sing well. A little bit more for me. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> it doesn't cost a whole lot. But when you really step up your worship game is when you surrender your life in meaningful ways. And something that uh, I've just been so encouraged by your life is the way that you've given the Lord your life in the last few years. And uh, a lot of the audiences listening to this might not be familiar with Commission Mankind and for you, but... Um, Give me a two-minute version of who you were before the Lord uh, called you into this most recent season. Uh, my wife and I have always felt called to the ministry, but I was another member of the church trying to support my family and working a job and knowing I was called to do missions, but not knowing how to get there and how to make it happen. And um, it would just begin to be a place of understanding that when God calls us and gives us a plan for our life, he doesn't give us the ability to do it. He wants us to trust him and to, to believe that the things that we can't accomplish, he can, and that's how he gets the glory. And so it was coming to that, that, that I say, coming to Jesus moment of knowing that there's no way I can accomplish this. It's impossible for me to figure out how to get to the mission field with seven kids. And, and, so and, did you have it in your heart uh, prior for years maybe to – go serve the Lord on the mission field? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like Even since my wife and I met and we were dating 22 years ago, I mean, it was like we sat down and we talked about this. In 2009, we really sat down together on a couch. We were praying together, and we were like, God, how do we get to the mission field? And we, it just began to be a continued burden, burden. And I feel like it's like a woman having a baby, and she's pregnant, and it just grows and grows. The, the pain never gets less until that thing is born. And we just begin to get pushed more and more and get enlarged in the waiting as God began to build that passion and my wife would come to me and we would revisit this vision that we'd wrote down for commission mankind and say, how can we do this? I remember at one point, this was maybe a year before we started commission mankind. My wife said, Joe, why don't you just quit your job and we just go to the mission field. And I said, wow, you know, I, I, I would, I would love to do that, but how are we going to survive? 
Your, your wife's crazy. Huh? <laughs> she is a wild. Everybody thinks I take her to the mission field. I'm like, y'all don't understand. My she wife drug you to the mission field. To the mission field. But I mean, her best friend was Jesus growing up. I mean, I'm married to Jesus as my close friend. Like they were next door neighbors. And so for me, it was coming to that place of saying, look, I will walk through any door God opens, but I'm not walking through a wall. I know I'm going to hit a stud. It's not going to feel good. But if God opens that door, I promise you, baby, I will run through that door. I'll run, skip, and jump through it is the exact words I told her. And in 2018, we heard about a need, and God began to open one door after another. And in 2020, in January, we moved our family of nine to a remote village in Kenya, and we got one well done. Last year, we did seven and piped the water to two more. This year, we've already drilled eight, and we have a so goal cool. of 60. So uh, it's just unbelievable. So maybe God a little it. context. Uh, Joel and his wife uh, heard about a need in East Africa for water. A lot of people didn't have access to it, and so you felt like the Lord laid that on your hearts. And you didn't really have any experience digging wells, but that's what you set your heart to do. And so you moved your whole family over there. And year one, how many did you d dig? Uh, I didn't get any done. The whole, God, <laughs> God got one done for me, but I went there with the intentions to do a lot, trying to use my abilities. And I was in construction field for a long time, and I thought I could go there and kind of use these abilities to push things to get the government to wake up to the need. It was a serious need. There was kids really, really suffering in this area. And I thought it wouldn't be hard to come and make people aware of this need and we're going to be able to get some help. But it was much more hard than I thought. And that was 2018? That was in 2019 when we first went. In 2020, we were living there with our family. And I was there for five months. COVID had hit and we didn't have a, a hole an inch in the ground trying to drill a well because we just I had failed I say we mainly me on trying to use all of my abilities and I think that's one of the biggest places that we miss it in the kingdom is we try to figure out a way to accomplish God's will with our abilities and it's not our abilities it's our surrender to his righteousness and his glory through our lives and him getting the glory through what's happening and the people that I was pushing the most these government officials that I was angry at um, they were the ones that that God wanted me to be Jesus to and I was missing the point while I was trying to get what his calling was on my life done, I was missing the point. The job is not for us to get it done. It's to be Christ every day. Hmm. And when God came to me and said, uh, Joe, if, you got, if you're not going to do this in love, I don't need you to do it. I was like, God, you got the wrong guy. I, I'm not the love doctor. I'm the get it done guy. I'm the guy you call when your project's behind. And God's like, well, how's that working out for you? <laughs> like, not too good. <laughs> And so uh, I then come to the realization that I, I was unable to get my calling done with the best of my abilities. And me and my wife surrendered to just a heart of love. And when I'd see the politicians, instead of getting angry and asking why they lied to me and why they, when they bring in a drilling rig, I'd be like, hey, how's your wife? How's the kids? How you doing? Oh, and they'd start telling me all these lies. Oh, we're coming with the drilling rig and this is going to happen. I'm like, how's, that's, that doesn't matter, man. Just how you doing, you know? And we left the responsibility of our calling to God and said yes to letting him love through us. And then within two weeks, somebody did a GoFundMe, and we raised 35000 for the first well. Man, that is so cool. And so that's, that's 2019. That was 2020. 20, 20. So, so for two years, you felt like it wasn't going anywhere, and then it just broke open. Broke open. When, when I learned I did it wrong for 40 years and that I couldn't accomplish God's will in my life. So many times we try to say, well, if I just get this, this, this done, or God, if you do this for me, I'm going to make this happen. And it's like a kid on the football field calling a timeout and pulling the coach out there and saying, hey, coach, I got a good idea. <laughs> Why don't you send these guys this way and that way? And the whole time, God just wanted me to get out the way so he can get the glory. It's the one thing he really wants is he wants to get the glory in what happens. And in our weakness is how he gets the glory. It's not in our strength. So it's in the things that we can't do that he gets the glory. And that was a hard thing for me to learn. It took quite a few decades. Yeah. So do you feel like you've got a, a handle on that concept now? It, how, you know, how often do you have to, rem to remind yourself? I think, you know, uh, mold and fungus grows overnight. Yeah. And I have to wake up every day and I got to scrape this fungus called Joel off. <laughs> and so that people can see. And one of the big parts was understanding that I am incapable of agape love. I really thought that I could practice agape love. I know that we all know uh, Eros is passionate love and phileo is, uh, you know, love with pretense and agape is love unconditional. And I really thought I could do that if I tried hard enough. And it wasn't until that day waking up in Kenya and God saying, I need you to do this in love, that my first thought was, 
okay, I'll try that. Then I was like, oh, no, I can't do that. I know I, I know I can't. I already know things about these people that's going to make me not love them. And so I was like, God, I'm not capable of it. He said, well, I know that. I've been trying to teach you that for 40 years. <laughs> and so when I came to the understanding that I was incapable of agape love and that only I could get out the way, that changed everything. It kind of took the pressure off of me. Right. So I do still have to practice this every day. I do have to still deal with this every day. It, it, that fungus grows overnight. You got to wake up and scrape it off in the morning. <laughs> Man. So with all the with all the ideas of missions, I mean, missions can be uh, church planning. It can be prayer movements. It can be orphanages. It can be all kind of things. And I'm sure that there were a lot of heartstrings that you had. What kind of zeroed you in on digging wells as being the thing? I mean, uh, somebody came and said there's a need for water, but why was that the thing that resonated with you? Did you feel like that was the moment the Holy Spirit spoke to you and said, this is what I want you to do? Or did you just feel inspired by it? I would say it's a, it was a joint process. But the main thing was that we were asking God for the opportunity for 10 years. Joy and I were praying. We had this vision written down with the goals of Commission Mankind, connecting the body of Christ to missions abroad, that there's been this disconnect over the last few decades where people send money, but we don't hear the testimonies coming back, and it's not people making these trips and coming back, and we don't see this excitement anymore. And so we wrote that vision down, but we had tried unsuccessfully to get out to the mission field in our own power. So when this this opportunity came, my wife had come back from this homeschoolers co-op, and she said, this lady been trying for 19 years, and so I went and met with her. She looked at me in the eyes, and she said, Joel, have you ever been thirsty and you couldn't find water? And that was the day it changed for me. And I told her what began to be our motto is that I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to do something. And she said, imagine your children thirsty, and you cannot give them a drop of water. And so I have a lot of children. So I thought about that, and I said, I don't know what that feels like. I mean, I grew up here in the swamps of Louisiana, What's the furthest I've ever driven to a gas station for a bottle of clean water? I mean, imagine waking up in the morning, walking for hours and hours with a bucket on your back, and again, going in a dirty ditch and getting this water and bringing this dirty water back into your kitchen after another hours of walks. And you begin to make food and tea for your kids with this really dirty water, and it's got to be dehumanizing. And then to wake up the next day and think, I'm going to walk for hours again, but I'm not going to get a water bottle. I'm not going to see a water fountain. It's not going to be a hose bib. It's going to be a ditch. And I said, that's got to be greatly dehumanizing to, to, to go through that burden every day. And people shouldn't have to go through that. And honestly, I think it's the, 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 um, the plan of the enemy to destroy these people and keep them in suffering. And so by bringing them out of suffering, we're, we're, we're growing the kingdom. We're growing the kingdom with the gospel. But this water stuff is very serious. Uh, you know, people can't stay awake in school. They can't even grow hair sometimes from, from lack of nutrition from unclean water. So going there in 2019 and seeing these kids that were like, oh, these kids must be six or seven years old. No, they're 13 and 14. But they're the size of seven-year-olds because all of the nutrients of the food they eat is flushed out from contaminated water. And so we said, this is real. And I don't know what we're going to do, but we have to do something about it because now we're aware of it. Wow. So, so in 19, y'all did one well? No, 20. 19, we went there, and we began to do some oh, work. 20, you did one well. And then 21, last year, you guys were able to do 10, right? We did seven, and we piped it to two more villages. You helped. I called you one day, and I'm like, I actually had my son go with his, uh, with his Apple Watch and check the elevation distance from one village to the next, and there was enough elevation change in the land. I called the water engineer, and they said, hey, we can make this happen with a two-inch pipe three miles long. And so I'm like, hey, Jonathan, can you help me out, man? I need, to, I need to get this, man, because we can do a whole nother village for like a third of the cost or less than maybe a fourth of the cost. And so we did that, and then we had to do it in another village because it got so crowded. The village doubled from 6,000 to 12,000 people when we put a well there. Mm, wow. So it began to be so crowded, the village chief came and said, we must pipe this water someone else. Hey, that'll preach right there. You know, you got dry churches. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the moment you moment you tap into the well, some wells, man, it draws people. That's right. All right. So, so this year, uh, 22, the vision is 60. 60 wells. Come on, man. That's a huge vision. Well, you know, in, in 2021, at the end of the year, uh, we were packing up the house. We ran a house there when we were there and, uh, we were coming back and, 
and my kids were seeing all these kids carry these dirty jerry cans and we did one well and people think we're superheroes and we like we're still seeing all the suffering even the village we were living in had no clean water we get our water from a pond and so um we knew that we didn't do enough and i woke up one day i said god told me to do five wells baby next year my wife said that's that's nuts joel she's like let's just go back we'll do one or two it's okay i said I said, God told me to go forward. And I said, forward from one is at least five. <laughs> he didn't say the number five. But you know how sometimes you just feel like the Holy yeah, Spirit, like, yeah, I, I feel five. Right. Come on. I know, I, I know exactly what I that is. I felt five. Like. And I said, we're doing five. She go, she's like, I just think that's crazy. So we get back. We didn't raise any money until, like, the end of the year. It comes January, February. We're getting ready to go back. We don't have any money for wells. And we're like, well, we're going to do as however many wells God does. And all of a sudden, we raise the money for six. And then somebody calls and says, we want to do a seventh. And then we piped the water to two more villages. And so God provides on his own timing. This is not my thing. This has always been his thing. Commission mankind belongs to him. But this year when I felt like God said 60, and my wife said, you are absolutely nuts. <laughs> we knew you were nuts with five. I said, look, God never hits but the mark. But, dude, here we are in February of 2022. I don't know when you're going to hear this podcast, but February of 2022, and we're at 15 now, right? We're at 14, but you just sponsored another one, right? So yeah. <laughs> 15, I'll take that. I'll take that. But uh, I'll take that by faith right there. Cause, uh, Snatch I, that. I've always been saying that. Y'all want to see the water shoot up when you come, and, and the team asked me, y'all going to save one for Bethany? I said, no, I'm going to hit Jonathan up when he shows up for that one. <laughs> I'm going to hit him up for that one when he comes. But, yeah, I mean, 15, we're one away from having one-fourth of – the goal for the entire year, and we're in February. I mean, that is unbelievable. And then on the airplane last year on the way back, I said, God, I know you can provide the money, but what about the people? You know, what about, or is the church going to say yes to this calling? We know we weren't the first ones God called to help this village. My wife said she felt God tell her that we were just the ones that said yes. And a couple reaches out to me, 68 and 65 years old, chemotherapy, already been through that, had a knee replacement the year, but, you know, uh, a month before they said, we're coming to serve your ministry for a year. We just want to give our lives to it. And I was like, God, if you can get them out there, they're going to be like the A team. And they went out there and they ran circles around what, what I was busting my butt for and improved it, making a better product in the communities. I mean, just so y'all know, the wells that we do, it's not like a little hand pump. We're drilling an eight and a half inch wide well through hard rock 500 but 600 to 800 feet down we're putting two ten thousand liter tanks up to 30 solar panels multiple taps and a giant baptistry so every church in the community can come and baptize troughs for animals so this is a this is a pretty large infrastructure project just on the construction side of it yeah it, you know the thing that i appreciate about uh commission mankind and and what joel and those guys are doing is it's, people have asked me the question, could you do it cheaper? Because typically a, a well for you guys is $35,000, which sounds like, man, that's a staggering amount of money. And I've had people say, could they not do it cheaper? And the truth is, yeah, you could probably do something cheaper, but it would not last and there would be all kind of issues with it. And you guys do such a good job that it's going to last for decades. I mean, these things are going to, they're so well done. So I appreciate that you hold the, hold the line and say, no, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. And it's going to serve these people for a long time. But I also appreciate that this is not just uh, putting food in their hand and water in their hand. This is giving them the gospel to talk, talk about that for a second. So uh, the first year that we did a well in 2020, excuse me, I felt um, we, God told me to do a baptism. And, you know, a baptism, pe the people in the town said, we need a trough for animals. We listened to the people of what they needed to work because they had seen failed projects. And so one of the reasons our system is the way it is is that we sat down with the people and listened, and we listened to the Holy Spirit. And they were like, you should do the baptism in one of the churches here. I didn't want to put one church above any other church in that community. I don't know the people there. I don't know everything that's happening in every single community. And I said, well, every church can have the opportunity to use this baptism. It's going to be in the center of town. This is what baptism, baptism is about. It's a public declaration. I said, what better place to do that than in the middle of town? <laughs> you know, I think baptism was meant to be out, out in the open. And so uh, the baptism is a big part of it. But then we go out and we evangelize in the schools. This year we saw over 4,000 people give their hearts to Christ. We passed out thousands of Bibles. We baptize hundreds of people. We do a big celebration service where we feed the entire village. We preach the gospel. We offer a chance for them to respond to the gospel, and then we baptize. 
and everyone that's baptized we give a Bible to. But we don't let anybody know we're giving Bibles because we don't want them to come get baptized just to get a Bible. And so now one of the local pastors that has we've worked through a lot, Reverend Benson, has the vision to plant a church at every well site. He's already planted three. People have donated land and buildings in each town mm-hmm. to plant these churches. And it's so exciting to see churches planted, and it didn't take any money from the U.S. Sometimes people think that it takes money to plant a church somewhere. It takes the gospel, like not just words, but the saving power of Jesus Christ to change hearts. People come together. They need a pastor. They need something real is happening. That's a church. Now, money helps, and, and we personally give to Reverend Benson, but as an organization, we're not per se, planting churches, but we support the planting of churches in those areas. And it's very exciting to see how it's working and see the leadership coming together. And one of the big parts of the gospel ministry is bringing teams in. Yeah. Last year we had 40 people come in. They're like, look, we don't know what we really have to offer, but, you know, I'm not even sure if I have anything good. If I come, what am I going to do? I said, look, just come. And we tell them, just come. We'll take care of it. You're going to see God's going to burden your heart. He's going to bring out what you were created to do. Because honestly, Jonathan, if people want to come, who put that passion there? You know, God put that passion and that desire in them. And so when they show up, I know that God put that passion in them. I know God's going to deliver. I'm not even worried about it. If people want to come to the mission field, that passion came from God. People don't just wake up and say, I want to go to Africa. Right. (laughs) You know, there's something there. And so I expect God to deliver when they get there. And just, you know, some of the testimonies, my, my son prayed for a lady that her eyes were glassed over. She couldn't see in front of her face, and her eyes got healed and cleared up, and he came running and grabbed me. Um, another team that was there, a whole family, husband and wife, they had never prayed out loud as a family. They were new, and so they were some of the members were praying out loud for the first time on these teams. So we saw testimonies in Kenya and testimonies at the church back here. And then one of them, there was a guy that was 100 years old. He was a World War II veteran, and I baptized him. It was wild. This guy was old. I mean, old. And um, the team that it did evangelism in that community had already gone back to the U.S. And they were watching a video of these baptisms, and they saw this guy being baptized. And the, the, the girl then tells me the story. I went to his home when we were doing door to evangelism, and he didn't want to hear about it. And we were explaining the gospel to him, and then he prayed, and he accepted Christ. Come on. And then That's she awesome. saw him get saved. Three months later, he passed away. But He's wow. got this young body. He's dancing in yeah. heaven. Jesus paid for his soul. It was so exciting to see that Jesus got what his blood paid for on the cross. That reward happened. And that's the treasures that we're not building. Man, in this yeah, life. just think of uh, the cost of if you hadn't gone. You know, even if it's just one person. Yeah. It spends an eternity in heaven versus hell. Even at 100 years old. Yeah. They accepted Christ. That's exciting. Well, Joel, uh, man, thank you for joining us today, and it's been great. And for those of you guys listening or watching, trying to figure out how to connect, uh, Commission Mankind is the name of the the ministry. Is it just commissionmankind.com? Yep. And you can sponsor a well. Yep. Or you can go, which what I love about you guys is you actually encourage people to go. And some some ministries are like, no, don't come. Just send your money. But I love that you guys encourage people to to, to buy your ticket. So, uh, well, Joel, you're the man. Appreciate you. You're doing great things for the kingdom of God. And uh, thank you guys for listening.